My name is Cristina and I work at EcoSurveys, which is a non-for-profit consultancy that is coordinating the uh, Playgreen project, Erasmus Plus project. Today we're going to do a webinar on best practices to green sport events and we will have uh, with us a special guest from the University of Santana. I want to mention that this webinar will belong to a toolkit on how to green sport events with volunteers and that if you have any questions you can email us at uh, playgreenproject at ecosurveys.net. As mentioned today, we have a special guest. Um, he's called Tiberio Daddy, uh, who is involved in the EU project Life Tackle. Tiberio is an assistant professor in sustainability management at Santana School of Advanced Studies, a public university located in Pisa, Italy. His research interests range from corporate environmental management, sustainable consumption and production, environmental footprint, life cycle assessment, assessment and circular economy. He is a project manager of relevant international projects uh, funded by the, mainly the European Commission and has been involved as a European project evaluator as well. Uh, without further to say, I leave the floor to to Tiberio, who is going to present the life tackle and is going to enlighten us with uh, best practices to green sport events. Welcome, Tiberio. Give you a very brief presentation in addition to what uh, has been said already by Christina about who I am. I am assistant professor, as mentioned by Christina. I work in Santana School of Advanced Study, that is a university located in the center of Tuscany in Pisa, the city of Leaning Tower. In the university, we have different six different uh, research uh, institutes. I am part of the Institute of Management, that is one of the six uh, research institutes. We, work, we are a group of around 40 people that work in the frame of sustainability management group. The Institute of Management uh, is focused on three different topics, health management, uh, innovation management, and sustainability management. And uh, we work on different topics like uh, proactive environmental strategy, circular economy, climate change, corporate social responsibility, and also uh, sport uh, sustainability management. In specific, uh, I'm happy to be here for Play Green Erasmus Plus. Uh, I will uh, speak and will show you some results that uh, we have. Uh, achieve in the frame of a life a project that is a name table. You can see here in the slide, the low side on the left, the, uh, the logo. And uh, we know, and we work with Christina and Hector and EcoService also in another project focused on sustainability and football, uh, where we are together partners. Uh, so how I have structured my uh, presentation. I will give you a brief introduction on why environmental management of football, uh, uh, and so giving you my idea regarding why uh, I think that uh, football, in specific professional football, should be focused on environmental management issues. Then I will provide you uh, an overview of what the life cycle is, so key aims, activity, results, which are the, the partners, and so on. And then we will focus on the key aspects uh, of this webinar of today. So uh, Christina asked me to try to provide some uh, practical example of uh, practice that uh, we have adopted in life cycle, or we have uh, uh, met during our path with life tackle adopted by other football organization or more in general uh, sport organization uh, if you have uh, take into account I'm sharing the screen and I don't see uh, the chat of the of, of the Google Google platform so uh, feel free to interrupt me any any and in any moment you want if you need uh, uh, me to go in deep uh, with some concept or with some information uh, regarding the slides uh, that um, I'm about uh, to show you. <clears throat> so let's start with the introduction. What about uh, environmental management of football or why uh, football should be focused on environmental management? I have identified uh, four uh, different uh, reasons. The first reason, uh, if I look to the 
topic of corporate social responsibility in the frame of the initiative uh, like uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, football uh, institutional bodies like uh, UEFA and FIFA, we can see that they are very active in corporate social responsibility, but uh, on certain topics that uh, uh, doesn't include, let's say so, uh, environmental management, because uh, uh, as probably you know better than me, take into account you are subjects of the football world, uh, they are focused on disability, they are very focused on racism, they are very focused on solidarity, and so, uh, uh, and so many important topics of corporate social responsibility, but less we uh, identify less message or less uh, commitment uh, at least until uh, uh, some years ago connected with uh, environmental protection even if uh, we have to say that uh, recently this trend or this commitment of uh, for example UEFA policy is changing uh, a bit uh, probably again you know that UEFA has been criticized by the fact that uh, Euro 2020 championship has been arranged in 12 different cities and so this will cause a lot of uh, carbon emission uh, due to the um, supporters or also players uh, and, and their staff uh, traveling and so uh, recently this is a news of September of uh, last year UEFA has decided to plant six 600,000 different trees in order to offset the carbon emission. So in order to compensate uh, the carbon emission due to the uh, travel uh, caused by Euro 2020. And so for the next year in this moment travel uh, foreseen for Euro 2020. The second reason is that uh, the topic of environmental football, environmental management and football is raising very fast, especially in the last years. So also giving a look uh, to the media, uh, we can find some news regarding, um, regarding this topic. So uh, for example, in the last World Cup, uh, it's quite, uh, uh, has been quite famous the, the fact that Japanese uh, fans start to collect waste uh, uh, after the match or there are some uh, clubs like uh, here in this snapshot of this news uh, real betis from uh, sevilla in spain from liga that has decided to be a climate neutral uh, uh, football club so they start a path that foresee the calculation of the carbon footprint emitted by their matches and by their or its organization and in order to then compensate by UEFA and we have seen the slide before to compensate their carbon emission or looking to the French uh, uh, championship uh, we uh, noticed that the French professional league has joined with WWF uh, a sort of agreement in order to boost sustainability in football in terms of uh, also awareness raising of, uh, of football support or passing to the Serie A and Juventus initiative uh, some uh, months ago uh, we heard about uh, the uh, news that Juventus has uh, uh, produced one of their shirts starting from recycled plastic uh, from plastic recycle from uh, ocean uh, or okay also taking into account the Premier League in uh, in uh, in England, uh, there is has been published uh, one month ago, not more, a news by CNN that has uh, done a sort of uh, ranking regarding the sustainability of the different clubs, and so uh, Manchester Manchester City, Arsenal, Liverpool, and so on has been ranked according uh, the sustainability action that they have in place, and so all these. Uh, media attention to the field and to the topic of uh, environmental management, to the topic of environmental sustainability and football is increasing a lot the interest around this topic. The third 
reason I would say is a more policy reason. So uh, if we look uh, to the European policy on sport, in specific at the European level, there is a, a work plan, uh, what is defined uh, the EU work plan for sport that uh, is, uh, has been issued in July 2017, and it, it will be revised in 2020. Uh, if we look to this uh, policy, we observe also in this case that there is a lack of connection between uh, sports policy and environmental topics. In specific, uh, here you can find uh, a snapshot of this uh, EU World Plan for Sport, that is the key policy act, as I was mentioning before. There is a specific section where this uh, uh, sport, uh, work plan for sport, uh, uh, declares to aim uh, to establish a uh, sport and environment wo working group in the frame of a sport and society initiative in, uh, with the aim to exchange best practice or to produce report to facilitate the spread of environmental management practice uh, in, in the frame of uh, professional and non-professional sport. And so I would say that this has been remained as an objective because in the frame of our project that I'm about to present you, uh, we have contacted the uh, uh, officer in the sport unit of the European Commission, and we have contacted also the Ministry of the French Ministry of Sport that you can see here in the fourth column. France is indicated as the managing country of this kind of working group regarding sport and environment, and they told us that. Uh, Actually, this uh, working group is not so active. And so the risk is that, uh, again, in the next revision of the EU work plan for sport in 2020, uh, there will be not uh, some specific and more effective targets uh, in the field uh, of sport and, and environment. And this is a, a specific uh, objective of our project, try to convince or try to facilitate the inclusion of uh, environmental targets in the frame of the work plan for sport uh, for taking into account the revision of, uh, of, uh, of this year. <clears throat> Finally, uh, the fourth, uh, last but, uh, but not least, I would say, the environmental impact of football. Uh, so how relevant is uh, the environmental uh, uh, impact of football? I have tried here to provide you some data in order to assess and to evaluate this, uh, uh, this aspect. So, first impact in my view, or one of the most important impacts, uh, is the uh, energy consumption. We have found in the frame of the professional stadium and professional football club that we have involved in the project that uh, a stadium in one year can achieve a total consumption of uh, uh, 8 million of kilowatt, kilowatt per hour. This consumption comes mainly from the lightning of the stadium. Okay, and here you can see how uh, in all stadium they are, for media reason, obliged to keep the lights switched on also during uh, the day if uh, you have a match uh, at the three in the afternoon here we are there is a picture of uh, mid of may in sevilla in real betis stadium and here you can see how the lights are on at three in the afternoon it was the last match of of liga spanish liga of last year or another consumption that i would say it's a needed consumption because before to start to work on this project, I have, I didn't know, at least me, probably it's, it's a problem for me. I didn't know this consumption that you, you can see here in the right side of the slide. These are lamps that are used by stadium and by football club to stimulate the, gro the growth of grass during winter time. So they want to replicate the lightning of summer or for spring using lamps. And these lamps, we were discussing 
with a top club, let's say in Serie A, one of the main important club in an Italian league, and they told us that only these lamps used during winter and autumn time accounts for at least 35% of the wool energy electricity consumption of a stadium. So it's a big impact. Or here in the small picture, you can see big fans. These big fans are used to give air to the grass in order to facilitate the growing of the grass. And this is a, a problem, the need of air from, uh, from um, uh, to stimulate the, grow, the growth of the grass in the stadium where the seats are very close to the grass, to the pitch, and so they cannot receive air from uh, the roof, uh, from, the, from the, the sky, let's say. And so uh, the, uh, we know how it's important now and how in the new stadium are built with the, the seats very close to the pitch in a, in a, in, with an English approach, uh, we, we call in Italy this kind of stadium. And here, uh, but here uh, can cause some uh, increase of energy consumption in order to feed these, uh, with electricity these uh, big funds. So what means 8 million of kilowatt, kilowatt per hour uh, in term of consumption. Here I include you some equivalence in order to uh, let you better understand. So uh, eight million of kilowatt per hour in an, in an hour in, in a year means like the wool consumption of 2,600 families of four persons. Uh, so pro uh, about 10,000 of people that live in a house with all uh, electric, electrical machine, washing machine, oven, and so on. Or a shoemaker company can produce more than one million of uh, leather shoes, men leather shoes, considering not only the consumption of the shoemaker, but the consumption of the wool life cycle of a leather shoes. So considering also the electricity consumption to produce uh, uh, the leader, the electricity consumption to produce the uh, accessories that are in the, in the shoes, and so on. Or 5.2 million of hours of an electronic uh, oven. It means the energy needed to produce uh, 4. million uh, cakes. So as you can understand, it's a very huge consumption of electricity. What about water consumption? We have found situations that consume around 100,000 of meter cube in one year to irrigate the pitch. And again, with this amount of water, you can fill in 40 different Olympic swimming pool, or uh, taking into account one of the most uh, water uh, demanding uh, manufacturing uh, uh, sector like a paper sector that uh, as, as probably you know they consume a lot of water the most important water consumption sector in the manufacturing sector uh, our paper producer can produce 50,000 of tons of tissue paper uh, and so a very big amount of paper uh, take into account uh, this amount of water Finally, uh, waste. Waste, uh, there are some situations where the waste are managed in a separate collection. Here you can see an example of uh, separate bins in the stadium uh, that have, at least in Italy, must have some characteristics like, uh, for example, the visibility of the contents uh, of these bins because uh, uh, many stadium manager and football manager are afraid or scared about uh, terrorism or other security issues. So they must follow certain specific, uh, uh, certain specific rules. But in this case, look, uh, these are pictures from the same stadium. They have separate bean collection, but what is happen at the end of the match is the right, uh, the picture on the right side. So. There are plastic, there are paper, there are uh, organic, even if in, in, uh, in small part, that are all mixed. 
And you cannot ask to the people here, we can see two legs of the people that are working on the stadium, uh, cleaning the stadium. You cannot ask in this moment uh, to separate uh, uh, the, the, the waste. So apart the waste that is collected with the separate collection bin, then the waste that is collected uh, after the end of the match or the day after is put in a compact and call it an indifferentiated weight, in a non-differentiated weight. So there are a lot of stadiums that still not differentiate uh, waste. Even if I know that, for example, for the stadium that uh, we lost uh, Euro 2020 matches, it's mandatory to have separate collection. So UEFA has put as mandatory rule uh, the inclusion, the uh, adoption of separate collection in waste, confirming what we were, I was saying before, that uh, the commitment also at uh, the UEFA and FIFA level or the commitment in the field, in gen the more general field of environmental management and football is increasing a lot. Uh, a lot in the last in the last um, in the last years. This is another example of uh, a banner that uh, in, in the frame of the life project that we uh, that I'm about to present you, uh, we will use to raise awareness uh, in the in the uh, in the of fans of supporters in the frame of some football match. We have a very challenging game that is uh, to. Uh, uh, hang these banners and other awareness raising action in uh, 30 different stadiums for 15 matches of uh, first division in uh, three di different first division in Romania, in Sweden, and, uh, and, and in Italy. Finally, uh, I have to say that why uh, the, the last question regarding environmental management football is uh, a problem of uh, environmental governance. So we have carried out uh, different interview, different case studies with different stadiums. Here you, you see the, the list in Italy with San Siro, with the Mapei Stadium and the Olympic Stadium in Rome. So are both a Serie A stadium, uh, but also National Arena in Bucharest, uh, the big stadium where play uh, Steaua and Dinamo Bucharest or Solna Arena in Sweden another 50,000 seats uh, stadium where the national team of Sweden uh, play or the Real Betis uh, Benito Villa Marin uh, stadium. Uh, so very big stadium. We attended uh, some matches and, and we interview stadium manager, waste manager in order to understand the governance. What we mean for governance? We mean organizational structure. We mean organizational procedures. So, so not at the operational level, so separate collection of waste, as we, we are seeing before, but at the management level, at the level of the organizational aspects inside the, uh, the football club or inside the uh, company that is uh, the stadium owner or the, or the company that manages the stadium as stadium manager. And let's uh, give a look uh, uh, to some answers. Uh, for example, Friens Arena, the, the owner of the Friens Arena of the stadium, declare us in, in this interview that they don't have identify any responsibilities or role in their organizational chart. In other words, they don't have appointed an environmental manager. Similarly, in Italy, the Olympic Stadium, again, a, big, a very big stadium, they have appointed an energy manager, but they don't have an environmental manager identified. And the same for Real Betis uh, yeah, in Benito Villa Marin, uh, uh, Spain. Again, uh, regarding performance indicator, monitoring of performance indicator, we ask, okay, did you monitor the consumption of water? Did you monitor electricity? Did you monitor how waste you produce uh, and if some action are effective in terms of re reduction of energy consumption or water consumption and so on? Again, the majority of the stadium manager or the majority of stadium owner told us, no, we don't monitor. We have some data regarding financial aspects like uh, the cost of electricity, the cost of methane gas that we use, but we don't have any systematic monitoring of key performance indicators. Or another issue regarding the governance aspect is, are the rules that they follow for purchasing procedures. 
I mean, do you, do you, do you know how much invest a first division club, how much invest a stadium owner of, us, of uh, 50, uh, thousand seats in terms of purchasing procedure, in terms of cleaning service, catering service, uh, in terms of many service or many products that they buy to manage the stadium. And uh, again, a lot of the interview companies or organization declare that they don't have in place any green criteria to uh, award suppliers of service of products according to green uh, practice adoption or green certification adopted. And so, uh, and so I would say that uh, there is not only an issue regarding the environmental impact of football, but uh, perhaps higher, there is an issue related to the environmental governance in the management of these companies. So how to face these environmental challenges? I don't know, because the challenges are quite high. I would say that uh, uh, I will try to explain to you how with Life Tackle, how with our project, we have tried to give, us, to give our contribute uh, to this kind of organization. I would say that even if uh, the environmental management at the level of governance or at the level of operational governance is not so spread, in my view, still in professional clubs or in stadium owners. I have to say that anyway, all of them are strictly committed. So our experience when we start to involve uh, this kind of big stadium and big uh, football club they were, they were all very interested, and we are collecting and uh, achieving a high level of involvement of, of, of these, uh, of these uh, organizations. So, in other words, I would say probably they are aware that they are lagging behind the, if compared to other, uh, to other sector like manufacturing sector that start to work on sustainability and environmental management uh, since uh, several years, uh, 20 years uh, with the chemical sector or uh, recent, more recently uh, or after in the following years also uh, the other sector. So somehow they are aware and they are very committed uh, to work uh, on, on this issue. Are you still there, Christina? Can you confirm it? Yeah, yeah, we're still okay, here. We okay. listen to you. I know you cannot see the uh, that what there's twenty people listening to you. So um, okay, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I invite the twenty people if you have questions to stop me whenever you want, or in any way we can have a discussion uh, at the end. Sorry if I ask because okay, this this morning I had a lesson and I continue to speak for ten minutes, and after the uh, a student called me, okay, you are uh, you have been. Stop, uh, your connection <laughs> doesn't work so i would like to avoid the similar experience yeah, in this webinar <laughs> thanks for okay, checking good. yeah okay if good. not i'll connect uh, you on whatsapp <laughs> okay okay so what about tricol is a an european project like play green is is co-funded by a program that is life program so is another funding program play green is funded by erasmus plus it's a quite big project because the total budget is around 2 million of euro. They are, they are not all funds coming from the funding program. In specific, life funds 60% of this budget. The duration is uh, around three years. We start uh, 18 years around 18 years ago. So we are in the middle of the, of the path. We are the lead applicant as uh, Santana University, but we have involved also additional seven partners here you can see the logo we have three national football association fgc from italy uh, the federation from romania and the federation from sweden and the other technical partner or partner dedicated to the dissemination of the activity which are the key objectives of decal that uh, are translated also in uh, in in, the, in activities uh, so the first aim is to identify and spread 
football environmental management practice um, in the football organization, in the football world. So take into account uh, this is uh, one of the aim of this webinar. Uh, I will show you which kind of practice we have identified, which kind of practice we are applying. After having drafted the guidelines that resume all of this environmental practice, we, we we will not, we are, I would say, we are testing this practice in 10. 10 was the objective of the project. Actually, we have involved 12 different uh, stadium, uh, all first division stadium, all uh, professional clubs or stadium owners, in order to carry out specific pilot action and so implement this practice operationally in their, in their context. A second uh, big action is uh, the activity referred to the environmental awareness of football supporters. So we are uh, recording videos uh, with uh, testimonial in order to be shown during uh, the first and second half of matches. We are producing banners uh, to hang uh, in the stadium or to ask to kids uh, to be brought uh, in the middle of the of the of the of the pitch when the player are in line before the starting of the match so different action aim to increase the awareness of football supporters uh, third we will work and we are starting now actually to work on the environmental governance of national football association that are involved in the three national football association because we think that not only football clubs and stadium owners but also the national federation, if they increase their environmental governance, could be a key actor to spread the environmental issues in the football world. And finally, as I was mentioning before, our policy objective is to increase, is to influence, is to update and uptake the results of life takeout project in the frame of the EU work plan for sport. So how we work in drafting of the guidelines, we have dra to draft the guidelines and to identify the best practice, we have worked in two different ways. Firstly, a very big, a very wide desk research. We collected 94 different reports. We have verified more than 3,500 pages inside this report. Report issue in different sport uh, area, in different sport contests. For example, Rugby World Cup, FIFA World Cup, Euro Olympic Games, and so on, or sustainability report issued by different uh, different clubs. What we are looking for? We are looking for best practice. We are looking for for environmental practice in order to identify what has been done before our project. Then we have started with the interview similar to the interview that I was showing before regarding the environmental governance, but uh, we have we have met also very advanced uh, uh, situation, okay? We have mentioned before the Betis Sevilla, but also uh, we have interviewed Juventus, that is uh, surely one of the most advanced uh, contests in Italy. But and we have interviewed Johan Cruyff Arena in Amsterdam that, uh, again, we think uh, they have a very advance uh, initiatives and, uh, and practice in, in place regarding environmental management. So during the interview, we have collected what they have done, which are the main challenges, and so on. And in September uh, of last uh, year, but uh, again, update uh, some months ago, we have published the guidelines. These guidelines you can find fully downloadable in the website of LifeTakeOver. These guidelines contain 84 different best practices adopted uh, by previous case, by previous uh, the, the reports that we have seen or adopted in the stadium that uh, we have uh, uh, interviewed. Here you have an example of list of these best practices that have, that have been classified according different topics like uh, event, like stadium management, like uh, procurement or like uh, mobility and logistics. So uh, in the guideline, you will find uh, a description of the practice, quite brief, because otherwise with all 84 different uh, practices, we need, uh, I don't know, 200 page of a guideline. And clicking on a link of the guideline, you will be able to open a template where 
uh, the uh, more a more in-depth description of the of all these different uh, practices is uh, is included. Then we are applying these guidelines. We are applying uh, this practice with pilot action in twelve different stadiums. These are the group of the stadium that are actively, very actively involved in our project. We have four stadiums from Italy, the Olympic Stadium in Rome, that uh, probably you know it will be the hosting uh, stadium of the first match of Euro 2020, Marassi in Genova, Ferrara where SPAL football club plays, uh, Palermo in Italy, then we have two stadiums in Romania, two, two stadium, big stadium again uh, in Sweden, and then we have four stadiums outside the three countries involved in the project. We have involved the Porto Football Club in Portugal, Betis Sevilla in Spain. We have the King Baldwin Stadium in Belgium and the Aviva Stadium in Ireland. Aviva Stadium, Olympic, uh, Stadio Olimpico in Rome and National Arena in Bucharest will be three hosting stadiums of uh, Euro uh, 2020. As you can see in the last column, our stakeholder, our uh, contact point, contact organization can range. We range from football club that uh, in some cases are also owner of the stadium, but uh, in other cases we interact with the stadium owner, in other cases we interact with the stadium manager, so the company that manages uh, the stadium. What they are doing, they are carrying out 60 different uh, pilot action. So you can see here, these pilot action are classified according to the topic. Many of them, they have chosen uh, uh, waste to work on waste, but there are someone that was on, on green procurement, the other, one, other ones that work on energy and so on. And as you can see, uh, the different stadium has chosen an approach to have different action in different uh, environmental uh, environmental field. So let's see some example of practice uh, reminding you or uh, reminding you that if you are interested to go more in deep in the practice, you can download uh, the, uh, the guideline from our website. First practice, one practice that is quite spread in different events, also in concert and so on, is refer to the avoidance of single use plastic. So there are some stadiums, there are some events that are working on reusable caps. So it means uh, the use of reusable caps that can be washed by the catering service, by the kiosk, by the bar inside the stadium, avoiding uh, the production of uh, plastic uh, as waste. We have done also a sort of uh, quantification of the benefits of the use of reusable caps in our project. In this moment, it has been applied in Marassi Stadium and National Arena in Romania. They have used 8,000 in total reusable caps. Here, for example, achieving 80 kilogram of CO2 saved or 24 meter cube of water saved. So a good, uh, let's say, achievement in terms of environmental achievement. Another very good practice that, that we have identified we have, identified, we have found an Italian producer of, of stadiums use uh, uh, stadium seats. Uh, they use, in particular, a blend of 40% of recycled plastic. Why only 40%? Because, as probably you know, these kind of seats are very hard, high level standards requirements in terms of prevention of fire, in terms of uh, durability, because they are heat from solar radiation, so they don't, uh, have, they, they must not uh, lose colors in during the years and so on. And so they have patented, uh, as a stadium seat producer of Italy, they have patented a process that uh, uh, allow them to produce a stadium seat with 40% of recycled plastic inside. Who, who is working on this? Uh, on this topic is working the Olympic Stadium in Rome. Again, very big stadium, 55 different uh, uh, seats uh, uh, in the stadium. And probably you can ask me why. I mean, 
I have to uh, change the seats. The seats in a stadium can last uh, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. Yeah, okay, if I decide to change all the seats, but a stadium like uh, Olympic Stadium in Rome has uh, for each year five, from 500 to, to 600 broken seats due to uh, the supporters' activity. Or the National Arena in, uh, in, in Bucharest uh, told us that uh, during the derby between Steaua Bucharest and Dinamo Bucharest, uh, they broke around 300 seats in one match. So it's clear that uh, you have room uh, to use the recycled seats. What, uh, this, what the Olympic Stadium in Rome is doing, I'm sorry here there is some word in Italian, but. Uh, uh, only to uh, explain you that the approach that they want to adopt is a, a circular economy approach. So what we are doing is to start with the collection of waste, the plastic, uh, of plastic waste uh, during the match, like a bottle, like a, a glass, uh, and so on. These plastic waste are collected and sent to a company that produce uh, the granulates of plastic that can be that is ready to be uh, recycled this company that produced the granulates are ready to be recycled send to the italian producer of seeds that is called omsi uh, these granulates coming from the plastic uh, of the olympic stadium and then the company will sell the plastic seeds uh, with the recycled plastics again to the stadium and so in a sort of circular circularity of plastic uh, waste of plastic uh, and so with an approach completely uh, compliant with circular economy principles another aspect another important issue regarding waste is uh, is food waste uh, okay some data regarding food waste one third of the global food production go in according to this uh, uh, report issued by Barilla go in the garbage. And if I take into account uh, the people that are dying every year or that they are not having enough food in the world, the food that goes in the garbage is uh, uh, around four times of the total food that uh, will be necessary to uh, don't have, uh, let's say, people uh, hungry in, in, in the world. So you can understand how the food waste is a big issue in the world. Regarding, regarding other data, regarding food, food waste, in this data we can see how in Europe, including Russian Federation, the main percentage of food waste are, is produced during the consumption phase. So while in other countries, like, I don't know, in Africa, the, the, during the consumption phase, the food waste is very low, in Europe, the biggest uh, portion of the food waste is connected with the consumption. So how can uh, a football club or a stadium owner uh, work uh, uh, on the topic of food waste? Through food donation. You have to take into account that uh, professional clubs have each Sunday a huge amount of customers, let's call so, that eat uh, in the hospitality area, in the VIP area. So, for example, uh, Juventus told us that each day has 4,000 guests each, each match day. Betis Sevilla has 1,800 guests. So, something like... Uh, uh, 18 different uh, marriage in the same moment. And uh, okay, when I was in the university, I was a waiter and I have very clear in mind how much food remain after a marriage. They have 20 or 25 different uh, marriage in the same day, in the same afternoon. So very big amount of, of food that remain fresh, that is not waste because it's a good food. And so how I can work, how I can reduce the environmental impact of, of this food through food donation. This is a, an issue that is working, for example, SPAL in our sample and the Real Betis. They are working with Caritas or with other organizations. They are establishing contacts, arranging the 
uh, take over of this uh, this food that has remained uh, from the matches and then arranging and using this food in the canteen uh, uh, that where poor people can go uh, to eat this food uh, the day the day after and so we are now discussing about uh, refrigerating uh, system in order to keep uh, uh, the food till the day after if the match is then in the night hour or how to transport in a safe way this, this, this food and so on so all practical issue in order to start uh, to donate uh, uh, this food again with food this is not uh, a practice that is adopted by our sample but is a practice adopted by uh, a football club in that uh, that play uh, in the fourth division of uh, England, the Forest, Forest Green uh, Rovers, uh, and is regarding the environmental impact of food. So looking to this picture, we can see how the greenhouse gas emission, according to the different diet, is less particularly low in the vegetarian uh, diet. While uh, uh, if you eat uh, fish uh, or meat, uh, the environmental impact of the diet uh, will increase. And so uh, what uh, has been observed that, uh, is that some uh, football clubs, some, foot, some, from some stadium owners that arrange in the VIP area uh, the catering and so on, are increasing the kind of vegetarian and organic uh, or organic food that they have ab available in order to reduce uh, uh, the impact of the menu that they have in the restaurant uh, the, where they have this huge amount uh, of people uh, eating. And so particularly advanced is the experience of the forest green rovers, as, as was mentioned before, that uh, they, uh, they declare in their website, uh, we are the world first uh, vegan football club. And again, looking at their website why the forest green rovers uh, are vegan they they claim that uh, one of the region the reason is the environmental and animal welfare so environmental uh, in order to reduce the environmental impact of food uh, of a diet uh, not not vegan or no vegetarian they also add that uh, uh, vegan food increased the performance of the athletes on, on the player of the players and Lionel Messi, the four Hamilton and Nat Diaz uh, and so on are, are, are vegan in order to increase their performance. So it's less connected with the environmental impact, impact uh, of, of football. But again, there are cases that are looking to the impact of food in terms of uh, uh, environmental uh, aspects needed to produce to produce it or we have identified uh, some initiative regarding the extension of life of the sports equipment so at the end of an olympic games or at the end for, at the end of a euro championship uh, you can understand how many uh, shoes uh, balls uh, or other kind of equipments you have and uh, in this case London Olympic Games uh, or UEFA Euro 2016 uh, donate this uh, uh, this equipment to in order to extend the life and the environmental uh, let's say to reduce the environmental impact connected with the uh, with the life and also also to reduce the uh, waste production we have found especially in the northern country is the artificial tar here we have identified and we have found uh, during the project a company from denmark that has uh, uh, certified a process that completely allow them to recycle artificial tar and so they declare uh, that uh, they can achieve uh, to a separation of the different parts of the artificial tar so baking sand rubber and grass fiber and can recover and reuse them for new artificial tar till 99% of uh, exhausted artificial tar. And also uh, regarding if you are interested in this, in this practice, you can find all the details of the company that has patented uh, this, uh, this practice. Another very advanced uh, situation, as I was mentioning before, is the Johan Cruyff Arena in Amsterdam. For example, they have 
uh, install 4,200 photovoltaic panels on the roof. In addition, uh, they have a battery storage. What is a battery storage and why a battery storage? Because it's clear that uh, having the solar panel that produce electricity, they have a situation where they produce electricity during the day when they don't have to light or to use light, uh, for example, in the offices uh, or do for the matches or they have less need of light. While during the night, the photovoltaic panel are not producing the energy. What, so what they have invented to solve this problem? They have a battery energy storage. So they have done an agreement with Nissan and they recover the batteries of Nissan Leaf. So because when the battery arrive at the end of life in a car, they have still storage capacity. They can still be used in the frame of an activity like this, a battery energy storage. So uh, Johan Cruyff Arena took, take, takes uh, the batteries of Nissan Leaf. They have a very big storage where they storage the electricity produced by the uh, solar panel in order to use this electricity in a different time, in a different uh, uh, day, uh, uh, compared to when it has been uh, it has been uh, uh, produced. Another uh, practice is the and the, is starting to be spread. It has been adopted in Expo Milano, but also in uh, New in the Jean uh, King National Tennis Center in New York is the. Uh, water refill uh, station. So, uh, and somehow there are also some stadium that are putting the water refill station in the in the stadium during the match in order again to reduce uh, the production of uh, bottles of uh, PET uh, of water uh, during the match, and so reducing from one side the waste and from the other side reducing the consumption of of, of plastics or Another uh, initiative is more referred to the footprint uh, of uh, the travels connected with the supporters. So this can be identified as a practice that uh, help to increase the awareness uh, of the supporters and uh, to increase their awareness on how uh, to, to have specific uh, mobility choices can improve the footprint and so can the footprint of the match or, or the footprint of their travel uh, methods. And so uh, in Euro 2016 has been experimented an internet-based tool uh, that is called uh, Eco Calculator regarding the calculation of the CO2 emission uh, referred to the behaviors of uh, the different supporters uh, or fans. Uh, okay, regarding mobility, there is uh, some initiative regarding scooter, electric uh, sharing and so on, but I would like uh, to speak, uh, to close my presentation again regarding energy consumption. Uh, the LED lights is starting to be uh, spread in different stadiums. Again, speaking with the energy manager uh, of Juventus, they told us that they adopted uh, LED lights uh, in their stadium since uh, two years ago, and they observe a reduction of the 30% of the wool electricity needed for the lighting. So, and somehow the LED lights uh, can produce uh, important results uh, for lighting in the stadium. And uh, there are still not fully mature, but there are also technologies that are starting to use. LED lights in the lamps that we were discussing before, in the lamps that the stadium use to stimulate the grass, uh, the grass growth. Also in this case, uh, there are some stadium managers that told us, okay, no, we are not so fully convinced about the LED lights uh, in these uh, lamps because these lamps that are not LED in somehow increase also the temperature uh, on the pitch because uh, uh, LID is a cold light, let's say so, and so the LID doesn't increase the temperature, but uh, however, 
uh, I was attending a conference uh, uh, in, uh, in Budapest uh, three months ago regarding football and sustainability, and I was a uh, uh, producer of LED lights, lights uh, lamp uh, to stimulate the growth. And, uh, and he, he told me that uh, uh, this is a technology that is starting to be spread, taking into account uh, uh, the huge consumption of this kind of lamps, uh, as I mentioned before. Again, I would like, uh, okay, Ryan, re water recovery system is another practice that is used by some stadium, especially uh, in, the, in the southern part uh, of Europe uh, or where I need the water consumption is higher to irrigate uh, the pitches. Uh, also in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, one stadium in Italy that is working on this topic uh, in, in the Tecol project in order to recover water from the roof and to storage it and to reuse it uh, uh, for the gray grass irrigation. Uh, finally, the last one is te technology or practice that I would describe you is this one, the second sun technology is again, is uh, to solve the problem of the lights uh, in, during winter. So what, uh, again, this Danish uh, consultant company has invented, has invented a system of mirrors. So they say that uh, putting this mirror on the roof of the stadium, they, this mirror help to direct in the right way in the right part of the pitch, probably in the pitch where uh, the, in the north side where uh, during the winter or during the autumn, uh, low quantity of uh, uh, sun rays arrive with this big mirror that are naturally moved uh, according to the move, to the movement of, uh, of, uh, of sun can be uh, valorized and direct the, the, the sun in the, in the right way. This is a quite advanced uh, uh, technology, I would say. I have never uh, seen applied. I have only, uh, we have only met this, this technology in the website where there is the description and so on. I think it's an interesting idea uh, in order to reduce the energy consumption due to uh, the lamps uh, that we were discussing before used to stimulate the growth uh, of the grass. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tiberio. It was amazing. Um, I asked you, I remember, to, to talk for 20 minutes and you like you overwhelmed us with uh, really good information. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if uh, every, anyone has a question. Um, if you do, you can either write on the right side, uh, there's um, a chat, and if not, you can unmute yourselves and then ask the question. Um, if not, I will, I will start because I, I do have one. Um, so, well, mainly it's that uh, it's very interesting, the guidelines that, that you um, have developed for Life Tackle. Um, Two things about that. The first one is, if you are okay, we can you can send me the link uh, later on. And we can uh, <laughs> spread the knowledge about it to, through a newsletter that we are gonna send. So we can um, we can uh, send them uh, to everyone that has attended and other people that who couldn't in the end. Very good, very good. Thank you. And um, have has people been using them and in like that that you know the guidelines so you just created them in september you updated updated them now um yeah have you been using the guidelines like other organizations as well uh, yeah 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 uh, all the pilots activity with the 12 stadium that uh, was show was shown in the in the play in, in, in one of the slides are applying uh, and uh, in the first uh, uh, step has been called to select uh, the most interesting one that uh, they retain uh, useful for their contest for the stadium and so on uh, and then now are applying this 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 practice in some stadium naturally not all 84 practice but all the, only a sample uh, of them uh, 
we will test the feasibility of this practice. So in somehow, at the end of the pilot action that uh, will end around uh, the, the, the initial end will, will be in June, but probably with coronavirus virus, uh, yeah. we will skip to September, taking into account that now the activity are quite uh, delayed, uh, taking into account that the, the football club are not uh, working. And, uh, and uh, uh, we will revise again uh, the guideline according to the lesson learned in the application of the pilot. So according to the results, according to the barriers or the benefits that uh, the, the stadium has experienced uh, applying uh, the practice of the guidelines and so uh, in somehow to uh, improve again the final and to achieve a final version of guidelines. Perfect. Uh, we have uh, two, one, a comment from Monica that says, thank you, very interesting and inspiring. Yay. And uh, from Adam, Adam Deacon, um, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. What would you consider to be the single biggest b barrier uh, to sports becoming more sustainable? Uh, actually, uh, okay, uh, I didn't have time because, uh, uh, okay, this, this presentation was... Uh, mainly focused on best practice but uh, we ha we are also trying to collect this kind of information through surveys and through interviews so we have carried out a survey with football managers uh, uh, regarding barriers benefits uh, uh, and so on so uh, i would say that uh, uh, the the main barrier that they have identified if i'm not uh, in if i'm not wrong is uh, uh, the fact that uh, the key stakeholders that with once they are interacting so media sponsors mm -hmm. or also as, as we have seen uh, football institution are not pressing are not increasing so much the pressure in the field of sustainability so uh, i would say that uh, in the last year this this situation is changing uh, but uh, uh, if, it's, if uh, we compare uh, with a manufacturing company where the customer is demanding green products uh, or where the supplier are offering uh, uh, green raw material even if uh, with a higher price or something like that and so the manufacturing company evaluates these aspects to increase their competitiveness still this uh, leverage, still this pressure yeah, that can uh, bring football clubs and stadium owners to voluntarily adopt uh, environmental management practice is not still fully in place. Mm. So in somehow uh, we should and we need uh, uh, more and increase awareness from the different players, from the different uh, uh, subjects that go towards sustainability. I Looking at, uh, let's say, the last 10 years. Yeah. If I look to a shorter time, in the last two years, on the contrary, uh, what is happening in the football world, at least in, the, in this kind of world, so professional football, uh, is, as I was saying, is that uh, uh, the interest and the commitment uh, is increasing a lot. Thank you, yeah, it's, it's very interesting because uh, Life Tackle uh, works at the more uh, big sport events at Play Green, more at the grassroots ones. So uh, we have a green team in different in different uh, countries that uh, that are going to apply best practices. So uh, it's very interesting to hear what uh, big sports events are doing and, and see what they can do uh, in the in the um, uh, grassroots sport events and I also think that they have a role to play not only at applying best practices but on communicating and, and putting uh, some pressure as you were saying um, to convince the, the sports clubs uh, and in general that there's a need to to increase sustainability so um, I don't know if there's another question for me there will be a final one uh, and it would be to what tips would you give uh, if you if you had to give a tip to to a green uh, a young person from the green teams um, on what uh, best practices uh, they could do in in a grassroots sport event what what would it be? Yeah, yeah, I I think that uh, young people are already much 
much more aware of uh, the need uh, to protect uh, our environment and to boost uh, the environmental practice. So I think uh, if in the future there will be managers of a uh, football club or also grassroots uh, football club, I think they, they will adopt or they will more uh, focus on environmental management compared to probably current managers mm -hmm. that uh, were, were part of a, of a um, group of persons that, that probably this, this issue and this awareness was uh, quite low. So regarding thinking to the environmental impact of uh, uh, grassroots sports, uh, I think that the mobility is, uh, can be a big issue. And the mobility especially where in the countries, or I don't know in Play Green which countries are, are involved, uh, but uh, in, the, in the countries where the density of the population is quite low, like for example Sweden, Norway and so on, I know that uh, uh, and where the number of uh, uh, football, grassroots football clubs is not so high, I know that uh, players or the staff uh, of the clubs have to travel quite a lot to meet or to uh, or to or to have the the football match with the, with with another football clubs. But it's similar also here in Italy. Okay, where the density is high, but looking for example to my kid that is playing basket and basket young teams are not so spread like. Uh, football young team. So when I was young and I play football young team, okay, in my grassroots uh, amateur tournament, uh, I find quite uh, near, quite close the a team uh, to play against uh, and 25 team to, to do uh, a championship. But again, also in a high density country like Italy, playing basket, uh, when I bring my, my, my kid uh, to play basket on Sunday, or when I brought <laughs> months ago, let's say, uh, uh, I have to travel more because I have to go to Florence, or I have to go to Pisa. Uh, uh, I am in the middle between Pisa and Florence as, as, at home. And so uh, this aspect, in, I think, in the amateur and grassroots sports uh, is, is, is a big issue, is important to arrange also travels uh, with, uh, with sustainable means transport means. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone who who attended. There was a moment where there were a lot of people. Now there are still 19 people. So uh, thank you for, for taking the time. And uh, we will post this online as well on, on uh, YouTube. So you will be able to, to see the presentation again if you want to. Uh, thank you, Tiberio, again. And Thank you. Uh, see you soon. Talk for our our project. Anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Adam. And thank you to everyone. Yeah, and Marianne is saying thank you, Edward. Well. Edward and so on. Marianne, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.